In this chapter, we're going to learn dimension reduction. So dimension reduction is one of unsupervised learning tasks. So without the label, we can reduce the dimensionality of the data set. Okay, and in this chapter, we're going to learn why we need this dimension reduction and what kind of algorithms we have. So first, we'll talk about dimension reduction. And then uh, there are many dimension reduction algorithms. But in this chapter, we're going to cover just linear algorithms, okay, PCA and FA, MDS, LDA, and ICA, NMF. And the nonlinear uh, dimension reduction algorithms will be covered in the next chapter. Okay, what is dimension reduction? So basically, uh, in general, uh, if we have more features, then they provide more information. They include a lot of information there, and potentially, uh, they uh, provide high accuracy for a task. Okay, that's good. This is positive thing, but you know there's no free lunch and there is a cost. So if we have more features, then it's harder to train a classifier because the classifier has more parameters. Okay, and then if we have more parameters, then we need more data samples. So that can be summarized by the curse of dimensionality. So this one says that if we increase the dimensionality by one, then we need uh, exponentially more uh, training samples. Okay. So if we increase the dimensionality by a few numbers, then we need a lot of more data samples to train the classifier. Okay. That is the curse of dimensionality. And also uh, more features could increase uh, possibility of our fitting. So basically, these two things says the same thing, okay? Actually, it is the other side of the same coin. Okay, in this uh, case, if we increase the dimensionality, then we need the exponentially more uh, data samples. But that's not the case. Usually, we don't have that many data samples. Then, what happens? If we don't have enough samples to train the classifier, then we have all fitting. Okay, so basically these two things uh, say the same thing. And uh, about this all fitting, don't worry, we will talk about this thing in detail in the uh, in in uh, in regression. Okay, in the regression chapter. Okay, and so in that case. So we have uh, a lot of features, but we don't have many samples. Then uh, this is a problem. In in this case, dimensionality reduction algorithms come to the rescue, like uh, PCR principal component regression. Okay, so they don't use all the features as a factor. Okay, so they reduce the dimension first. So let's say uh, we have one hundred features. Okay, one hundred. A thousand features, and that is too. Uh, that is too uh, many uh, features. Then uh, we reduce the dimensionality from one thousand to say ten. Okay, then we're gonna build a classifier, or we're gonna build some uh, machine learning algorithm based on this ten dimensional space. Okay, instead of a thousand dimensional space. This is what uh, dimension reduction does and it finds continuous latent variables. Continuous latent variable means this 10 dimensional space in this example. So we have a 1000 uh, dimensional space. This one, is, uh, this one is the space where our data samples exist. Observable space. And this space is not observable, it's hidden, it's latent. So in, in the clustering algorithms, we actually uh, assigned all the samples into uh, categories, okay? So let's say 1,000, uh, this is dimensions. Let's say we have 2,000 samples and we assigned 2,000 samples into three categories, which means one cluster, this one will generate the sum of these samples, and this one generates the sum of this, and this one will generate the sum of this. So these are kind of discrete latent variables. But this one, this one is 
10 dimensional space. From 10 dimensional space, uh, we have a vector, and this vector is corresponding to uh, one data sample in the 1000 dimensional space. So 200 samples will be transformed into this 10 dimensional space. So in 10 in 1000 dimensional space we have 2000 2, samples. In 10 dimensional space we have 2000 samples. So uh, demand reduction is is finding continuous latent variables and the clustering finds uh, discrete latent variables. Okay. And for example, uh, we have an image like this, then each image has 20 by 20 pixels, 400 pixels, which means one image is a point in 400 dimensional space, which is quite high dimensional space. Okay, but think about this one. When face images are generated with the three latent variables, okay, left, right pose, and up, down pose, and light directions. So, uh, if we have only three factors, which is uh, three latent variables, with these three factors, okay, we actually change the image, okay. So if we take a photo, face photo, okay, if we change the light, uh, the pose, and if we change up down pose, and if we change the light direction, then we might have lots of, lots of images face images but think about this one all these images are actually the same image in the different uh, pose and with different lightning direction then uh, we can we can see these three uh, three dimensional uh, factors okay so based on these three dimensional factors we actually generated a lot of face images okay and this is what I just said. Face, faces lie on a three-dimensional manifold embedded in the 400-dimensional image space. Okay. As I said, images can be generated by translation up, down, left, right, and rotation. So the same image three can be rotated and translated to generate lots of images. But in this case, you know, if you look at these pixels, uh, three. Uh, this image is my bit too easy, but in general, think about some uh face image with some background. Okay, then if we uh translate, and if we rotate the face, then we generate lots of uh, face images. But if you look at the pixels, if you look at the face images pixel by pixel then this image and this image is completely different. In this case, yes, yes, backgrounds have the same pixels, but in general, uh, lots of pixels will have different intensity. Okay, they change. So uh, even in this case, let's say if it is 20 by 20 images, then probably around 100 pixels might change with these operators. But even uh, when the 100 pixels are changing, but actually we just apply three operators. So we have only three factors. So demand reduction is actually interested in these factors, hidden factors, hidden variables. This is continuous latent variables. And the PCA or principal component analysis is one of the most popular and the simplest demand reduction methods. And it is a linear projection and it finds an orthogonal basis set that makes the largest possible variance on the linearly projected space. So this figure explains pretty much uh, of a PCA. So we have a lot of uh, data samples as a blue dot. And then this one, think about this one. If, if we have to use just one dimension to represent all these data samples, then which dimension would be the best? So this one. 
is the best dimensions. And what is the next? This one is the, the second. If we have a three dimensional space, then we have first dimension and the second dimension and the third dimension. So basically, uh, we want to preserve all the information of these samples. So in this case, you know, if we represent all these data samples with one dimensional space, then this sample should be projected onto this axis. Then each data point lose some information this much okay but this one will lose a little of information but this one will lose lots of information but think about this one if we have a, a dimension in these directions then this one will lose a lot of information this one will lose lots of information lots of information yes uh, these ones will not lose a lot of information but we have uh, many uh, data samples who are losing lots of information when they are projected onto this dimensional space. So this dimension is better than this one. Intuitively, you can understand that, right? So we're gonna prove that. We're gonna prove why this direction is the best direction with some equations. Okay, first, PCA uh, PCA minimizes uh, reconstruction error. Reconstruction, what is the reconstruction? So in this figure, we have a three-dimensional space. Okay, and then we want to project. For now, uh, you, don't understand, you don't have to understand uh, what kind of W we have, okay? So for now, let's assume that we have a two-dimensional vector. And we're going to project all the data samples with the two uh, vectors. So now we have a two-dimensional representation like this. So we just project it. And then after projecting, then we can reconstruct uh, these three-dimensional vectors, three-dimensional samples from the two-dimensional space. So when we actually uh, reconstruct, then we, uh, uh, we lose this much information we lose this much information. If we have a sample right on this two-dimensional space in this three-dimensional space, if we have a sample on this kind of paper, then <coughs> when we project and then when we reconstruct, there is no reconstruction error. It's perfect. But <coughs> if we have a sample like this, then uh, when we project, then this sample will be on this two-dimensional space as a one point. Then when we reconstruct, then this one will be around here. Okay, so we cannot go up actually. We lost that information. So uh, PCA want to minimize uh, this error. So when we reconstruct the data samples after projections, then the PCA wants to minimize this error. So it minimizes a uh, reconstruction error. Okay, the question is how? Okay. And also at the same time, PCA maximizes preserved variance after projection. So in this slide, we are gonna prove that this minimal reconstruction error from the previous slide is the same as maximal preserved variance. So preserved variance means after projections, after projection, we can calculate the variance, and that variance should be maximized if it is a PCA. Okay, so let's see how uh, these two are the same. So, given a centered data matrix, the centered data matrix means when we actually uh, calculate the average of these data samples, the average is origin, is a zero vector. So we can do that and many times we do this or sometimes we assume this okay and when we have a, a centered data matrix x then rss the reconstruction error can be represented by this okay so if you look at this figure then you can understand why this is an error so this one is original vector okay and this one is a projected uh, vector Actually, 
if w is vector then th this one is a scalar so we are projecting the data samples into one dimensional space so we are talking about just one dimensional space here okay and this is a projection and then this one is actually a reconstruction so we project x x sub i onto this vector and then we reconstruct this scalar with the vector w into the original space so uh, this one is a reconstructed vector so that's why this is a, a, a reconstructed error and obviously uh, the norm of w should be one otherwise you know when we project and reconstruct we have to multiply uh, constant and divide the con the number with the constant so it's complicated so for convenience then we just put this constraint okay then when we rewrite this uh, error reconstruction error then we get this term so it's a simple derivation and then arg mean with respect to w is of this uh, uh, reconstruction error is equivalent to argmax of this one because uh, this one is 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 fixed it is not changing when we change w so it is it is constant okay when it comes to w with respect to w this is constant so uh, by changing w we can actually change this part so uh, argmax W RSS is exactly the same as argmax W this term. Okay. And then when we uh, uh, derive this variance of this one, this one means actually preserved variance after projection. What is the variance? Okay, so when we actually calculate this variance after projection, then we get this one. This one is just the definition of a variance. And Look at this one. This one is actually uh, one of n w x i transpose n square because w is kind of constant, so we can actually put this w out of this summation. And look at this one. We assume that the data is already centered, so this one is zero. So it just cancel. And now uh, variance is this one. And uh, this one is exactly the same as this term. So now uh, we just, just proved this one. Minimal reconstruction error is exactly the same as maximal preserved variance. Okay, so this one says, you know, when we project uh, our data samples onto one vector, then we want to minimize this error after projection we want to minimize this error or this one is exactly the same as uh, 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 we want to maximize the preserved variance so if we project the samples here then look at these samples on this uh, vector the variance is high but if we project the samples onto this vector, okay, then we'll have lots of samples like this, and the variance is quite small. So this one is the vector with the maximal preserved variance. So these two things are basically the same things. We just proved with the equation. Okay, now on this slide, so we're going to use, uh, we're going to drive this maximal variance, maximal preserved variance to eigen decomposition problem. So it says finding the maximal uh, preserved variance is finding the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue and eigenvector. Okay. So this variance can be rewritten like this. Instead of using summation, then we have a matrix notation here. So X is actually set of all the data samples. 
and then we can rewrite this equation like this and finding uh, the argmax w uh, of this variance with uh, with this constraint can be done by Lagrangian multiply, Lagrangian function. So this one is Lagrangian function with Lagrangian multiply here. So this one is actually this one. And if we put uh, C like this, okay, then one over N and X, X transpose is C. So which means this one is uh, w transpose C W. Okay, so uh, we have objective function to maximize, and we have a constraint. So now we are going to use a Lagrangian function. Okay, and uh, this one is here, and this one is a constraint. So we put the Lagrangian multiplier, and uh, we have a constraint here. Okay, then next step is to take a derivative with respect to w. Okay, so this one is here and this one goes here. And then we got this one. See, w is lambda w. This is exactly eigen decomposition problem. Okay, so w and lambda are the eigenvector and eigenvalue of covariance matrix C. Okay, so uh, maximal uh, preserved variance is exactly the same as the largest eigenvalue. And when we have a maximum preserved variance, the vector w is actually the largest eigenvector. Okay, so uh, we can rewrite this problem with this objective function. Okay, and this one is this one is a Rayleigh quotient. So in general, a Rayleigh quotient can be uh, defined by this ratio. Okay, so we have one matrix here and another matrix here. But in the previous slide, S was identity matrix. It's a special case of a Rayleigh quotient. But in general, uh, we have uh, this term. Okay, so. To solve this problem, to maximize this Rayleigh quotient with respect to W, uh, this maximization problem is exactly the same as this Lagrangian problem. Okay. And look at this one. We can derive this term again in general. So considering the scale invariance like this, J, C, W, C is constant. We multiply constant to a W vector. Then we have a C here and a C and C and, and the C here. Okay, then the, this C can go out. So we have a C square and C square here. Okay, then uh, we can cancel these each other. And then this one is exactly the same as JW. So if we multiply some constant to W, it is exactly the same as original objective function. So it is sufficient to consider uh, that W transpose SW is, is one, okay? Because it doesn't matter. There is an invariance here. So uh, we use this one as a constraint then we multiply a Lagrangian multiplier to make a Lagrangian function here. So this one and this one is exactly the same. Okay, same uh, problem. So let's, uh, let's uh, solve this problem in general. So when the S is invertible, in the previous slide, the S was identity matrix, which is invertible, invertible. So the previous slide, corresponds to this case one. Okay, when we uh, drive, when we take derivative of this, then we get this one. And we have this equation. And if S is invertible, then we have this problem, this equation. And uh, this one is one matrix. And this one is exactly eigen decomposition problem. Okay, 
one matrix w is lambda w okay but if s is not invertible then we have to add another constraint this one so we had one constraint then we one have another constraint and then uh, from this we have a first logarithm multiplier and second logarithm multiplier and we take a derivative with respect to uh, w then we have this term okay then uh, finally we have uh, this equation so in this case beta i is actually a regularization because s is not invertible so we have some identity matrix times some constant so look at this equation the, the matrix this matrix is not invertible with some some uh, values and then if it is not invertible then if we add some strong value on the diagonal element then it will become invertible so if we increase beta then at some point this one will be invertible so we can take a, an inverse of this matrix now we can solve this problem so this this slide is kind of a little extra but this slide shows that uh, this one is actually a, a generalized eigenvalue decomposition problem which is exactly the same as this one and uh, this one shows us uh, the solution of eigen uh, solution of principal component analysis now uh, let's take some examples and the five the first five eigenvectors of covariance matrix of MNIST data samples look like this again the uh, one uh, MNIST data sample the size of the data sample is 28 by 28 matrix Okay, but when we uh, consider uh, data samples, then we just use a vector. Okay, and 28 by 28 time, uh, times 1 dimensional vector. Okay, so after, uh, after eigen decomposition, then eigen vectors will have will be a vector in the 228 by 28 dimensional space okay this is one eigen vector then we can reshape to make a image and this one is corresponding to this one and this one and this one so we actually show uh, the five eigen vectors and actually we have 28 by 28 eigenvectors okay and when we plot the eigenvalues then the, we can have this curve and based on this then we can we can calculate the eigenvalue ratio r sub k then we uh, uh calculate we sum the far the first uh, first k eigenvalues here and then over all the eigen sum of all the eigenvalues okay and that is uh, eigenvalue ratio and if we use 10 eigenvalues so it, it means k is 10 then it is 48.9 percent which means if we use first 10 uh, dimensional space then we can represent almost the half of the variation the variance Okay, and if we use 50, then it can cover 82.5%. And if we use 100 eigenvalues, eigendimensional space, then we can cover 91.5%. So instead of using 28 times 28 dimensional vector, if we use just 100 uh, dimensional space, then we can represent 91.5% of all the information okay so we can use uh, this kind of principle for data compression or pre-processing or feature extractor so we can actually 
extract some uh, features in load manual space, or we can use it uh, for data visualizations. For data visualization, visualization, we need to project the data into two-dimensional space or at most three-dimensional space. Okay, so if we have uh, four-dimensional vectors, then it's not possible to visualize. Okay, so we can use uh, this for many applications. And especially if we apply uh, eigen decomposition to uh, face data, then we can have uh, these face images as an eigen uh, vectors. This this one image corresponds to one eigen vector, so we we call it eigen face. Okay, so given this data set, and uh, we can get these eigen uh, faces. So look at this one. The first eigen face represent the most common face, okay, and the last one, uh, the last one will focus on just not frequent features.